So since we have a few people in, I will go ahead and get started. We will be recording the session, so um, for those who join in late or unable to attend the live session, um, they will be able to access a recording later on. So welcome everyone, and thank you for participating in the Pebbles of Hope inaugural webinar series commemorating National Prematurity Awareness Month. I'm Cheryl Chotrani, and I'm the Executive Director of Pebbles of Hope. Many of you have signed up for multiple sessions in our series, um, but for those of you that uh, don't know, our series for the month of November consists of a total of four sessions, all covering topics related to premium nutrition, and this is our third session. We do have one uh, remaining session next week on Monday um, covering the topic of infant food allergies. The Pebbles of Hope mission is to help premature babies thrive through parent education, and the webinar series is our first step towards achieving that goal. To learn more about the organization and our activities, please visit our website at www.pebblesofhope.org. We really appreciate your support and hope that you will find this in an informative session. I am delighted to introduce to you our speaker for today. Sandra Robbins has worked in pediatric nutrition for many years. She's currently employed by Fairfax Neonatal Associates at the NICU at Inova Children's Hospital and at the Pediatric Pulmonology Practice, the Pediatric Lung Center in Fairfax, Virginia. She works with physicians in development of nutrition care protocols that promote the most optimal outcomes for NICU babies and sees children with complex nutrition care needs after discharge, including including those with, who need tube feeding. Prior to working in these current facilities, she was at Children's National Medical Center working with similar populations. Sandra has published several journal articles and edited two books related to handling of infant feedings in healthcare facilities. She currently co-chairs a work group of an NIH-sponsored project to develop guidelines for nutrition care of NICU infants, the PREB project. In 2011, she was awarded the American Dietetic Association's Award for Excellence in Clinical Practice and has received numerous other awards throughout her career. Before we get started, uh, I just wanted to cover off a couple of housekeeping items. All attendees will be muted for the duration of the session. However, uh, after the presentation or even during the session, you can submit questions via the chat bar on the side of your screen. Um, so once the presentation is done, I will read out the questions, and then Sandra will read them um, as time uh, will answer them as time allows. So with that, I will hand it over to Sandra. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here, and we'll just go ahead and get started. This is what we're going to talk about. Uh, why is nutrition so important in the NICU? What is the best feeding for an infant in the NICU? What is unique about the feeding and growth premies before and after discharge? I think of uh, the NICU as nutrition in the fast lane. The third, in the third trimester, there's a six-fold increase in a baby's weight. Baby goes from one pound to six and a half or seven pounds in that short period of time. The next time that happens from term, the baby is five or six years old. So it just kind of puts in perspective how much growth and development goes on in that uh, third trimester period of life. All organ systems are in a critical development phase, and, and they aren't all developing at exactly the same pace, but um, all are immature um, before term age. And because babies have to adapt to the extra uterine environment in the first week, and that's a little tricky when they're immature, um, almost all babies get a little bit behind at first, and many infants are discharged with growth deficits and that take months or years to catch up. So in the NICU, we think about short-term goals and about long-term goals. In the short run, we are eager to provide nutrients and other factors, such as immune substances, hormones, growth factors, just enough to keep the baby alive and well. Um, we also want to, of course, support the best brain and organ development and other growth. We would like to set up the GI tract for normal growth and development. And we realize that feeding is important in comforting both, comforting both the infant and the family. In the long run, we know that how well we do that job is important for the development of the best possible IQ and physical development. 
We want to avoid sending infants up for chronic conditions such as obesity, diabetes, allergy, and hypertension. And believe it or not, it, um, those can be um, linked to NICU uh, experience. And in short, we just want um, smart, strong children. So the way we do things, we usually divide our protocols into about five different phases. We have the first day of life, then working up the, to full nutrition support during the first week or two. Then there's a period of feeding and growing the entire NICU stay. We probably have to make modifications for discharge to be sure that our feeding plans are going to work at home. And then we also have to think about uh, being sure that we're on top of things for the first year or two so babies can catch up to their maximal potential. So our, our first goal on the first day is to do as close as we can to what the placenta was doing for the baby, and that is providing protein and some sugar. So we have starter IV nutrition solutions in most NICUs today that contain protein, glucose, calcium, and we start these as soon as we can. As soon as we get lines in, that's usually within the first um, couple hours of life. And then we would also like to provide colostrum to the baby. And this is where moms come in. Obviously, we, if mom isn't pumping and we're giving us colostrum, we're not going to have any for the baby. So the colostrum is important because it provides unique protection from infection. Um, there's a unique mother-baby match. So, and um, it also colonizes the gut with what we think of as the good bacteria. I re often refer to it as the original probiotic. So we use IV nutrition in babies that are born less than 34 weeks um, or those that we know we can't f feed soon because of conditions they were born with to get to what we call basal calorie needs as soon as we can, but certainly no later than day of life three. So basal calories and protein are what's needed to keep the baby from having to break down its own tissue just to supply its own cells. We use the colostrum as soon as it becomes available. We begin systematic what we call trophic feeds or some people call it minimal nutrition um, by tube or by mouth um, as early on. And most of our babies will be fed within 24 hours. Um, sometimes it's a little bit later. Some babies are actually fed on the very first day of life. But you start with very small amounts, and it varies by, nutri by NICU how much to use, usually for the smallest babies between 5 and 15 cc's per kilo. Um, so if the baby only weighs half a kilo, we're talking about as little as half a teaspoon of milk divided up into two or three feeds. So it, it's very, very slow, but it's very important to stimulate the development of the GI tract. We use mother's own milk whenever we have it. Uh, if we don't, we have donor milk um, supplies in many NICUs now. If we don't have donor milk, then formula would be used. Um, we provide full nutrition support adequate for normal growth as soon as we can. Some babies will tolerate it between the third and fifth day of life. Some babies it takes a whole week to adapt to tolerating enough of um, the kind of nutrition we have to offer outside the, uh, the womb. So our goals during the NICU stay are normal growth, certainly to pr promote the best possible brain and other organ development. We like easier said than done in a baby that has an acute experience. We'd like to um, recognize that feeding comforts many of us, infants and families both, and that feeding skill development and interaction with a baby's feeding time is important. Um, and of course, we want to avoid infection and um, the condition called necrotizing enterocolitis, which is an inflammatory disaster uh, that can 
cause uh, death of some of the cell, some or all of the baby's intestine. So before discharge, we'd like to have the baby grow normally in all parameters, not just weight. We want length and head circumference as well. We don't want short, fat babies, nor do we want underweight babies. We want to do, have done everything we can to develop normal GI motility. Um, gastroesophageal reflux is common in all babies, and NICU babies, uh, the development of motility is set back uh, considerably uh, compared to a baby that is born at term, and reflux is one of our most pesky problems. We want the baby to learn to suck, swallow, and breathe in a coordinated fashion. We'd like to have the baby practice feeding at breast and with a bottle both. And of course, we want to avoid neck. And other nu nutritional deficiency uh, diseases that can occur in NICU, such as rickets. So in the year uh, after discharge, we'd like the baby to be able to catch up to whatever its potential for size is. So we would start with breastfeeding, um, but we know that breast milk may not um, meet all the needs for catch-up growth. So we usually uh, try to supplement protein, iron, zinc, calcium, phosphorus, and maybe some other nutrients as well, vitamin D for sure. Um, we want normal development. We like to avoid being too fat or too thin. We just said that uh, before, and that um, we we focus on some organs that are particularly immature at uh, at discharge, such as bones, lungs, and there there may be others. So why is there so much emphasis on breast milk? Um, human milk provides medicine as well as nutrients for infants. It isn't just the feeding; it's the medical part that we're really interested in uh, in the first days, for especially for a preterm infant, because it helps protect the baby from infection, um, from risk of allergy later on. It stimulates growth of the gut in a unique way. Um, also, brain, eye, and other development um, are stimulated uniquely by human milk. And even some of the nutrients in human milk really can't be matched uh, by formula. If we don't have mother's own milk, there are mothers that have medical conditions that don't allow them to uh, provide milk to their baby, then um, we can purchase donor milk. This milk is usually milk that is from mothers whose babies are much older than the baby in the NICU is going to receive that milk, and the nutritional composition isn't perfectly matched to the needs of the preterm infant. So we have to fortify it, and we really don't have the ideal fortifier yet for donor milk. And it's expensive. It can cost um, between 400 and $700 a day to keep a baby on uh, exclusively breast milk. We do have preterm formulas, and we've used them for many years, and they've been shown to support good growth in babies. What we have available to us today are all cow milk-based formulas. These specialized formulas, there are specialized formulas available that for infants that are sensitive to cow milk or who have strong family history of allergy, um, but most of these are designed with a nutrient profile appropriate to a preterm inf or term infant, and for preterm infant, we have to make some adjustments. There are specialized formulas for preterm infants once they leave the NICU, and these are usually recommended for use during the first year of life. There are some specific nutrient in issues in the NICU that we focus on a lot. The first is protein needs are very high. Breast milk is the very best quality, but the in smallest quantity of protein. So usually we have to find a way to fortify that if we want to achieve normal rates of growth. Calorie needs are very high. They are five to six times that of an adult. A, a baby that is fed via the gut 
uh, needs 120 to 130 calories per kilo per day. And that compares to you and I at 25 to 35 calories per kilo per day. So it's huge. What we're asking these babies to do is like eating Thanksgiving dinner every three hours around the clock. It's a hard job. Growth delay has been associated with poor developmental outcomes, so we really focus on normal growth. Bone mineralization is never as good as it was in utero. The placenta is so much cleverer than we are than in delivering calcium and phosphorus. But the good news is the bone mineralization can catch up by two years of age. Mineral stores are accrued primarily in the third trimester in babies. So things like iron, calcium, zinc, and others are saved up. The third trimester are in short supply in the baby in a preterm infant. And often what we've been able to feed the baby has supplied daily needs, but not enough for, for accruing stores. So these are things that need special attention over the first year. Fatty acids are have unique, important, and uh, have received a lot of attention in the last few years. It's because the brain is rich in unique fatty acids. In fact, our neurologic tissue is about 70% fatty acids, so um, we it's very important to the infant to have a, a high fat diet and have the appropriate fats. We have an IV fat source, but it's not ideal. Um, fatty acid composition of human milk, human milk is unique and provides special fatty acids that are plentiful in brain tissue. And probably more than anything else in the mother's diet, what kind of fatty acids she has in her diet affect directly what's going to be in her milk. And omega-3 fatty acids are important to the baby and the mother for that matter. So it's important that mothers... Um, either eat fish regularly or take a, a supplement that contains omega-3 fatty acids or DHA. Many of our prenatal vitamins have a DHA supplement in them, so, and many uh, breastfeeding mothers continue to take their prenatal vitamins. Formulas are supplemented with DHA and have been shown to improve brain and eye development. We have human milk fortifiers. These are special um, little packets of um, a combination of protein, minerals, and most vitamins. There's usually a packet that has about 5 mLs or 1 teaspoon of liquid that we add to 25 mLs of breast milk, or just under an ounce, and that, that makes rounds up to an ounce of a feeding. Um, we but needs of babies are different by different gestational ages, and we have to carefully select the right fortifier and um, use it, you know, and, mon and monitor the baby closely that it is growing well on um, the milk, the fortified milk. Um, there are both human milk, uh, human milk fortifiers and cow milk fortifiers available. If a baby is born less than 35 weeks, usually they're not able to suck, swallow, breathe adequate quantities of food to support normal growth. So for many NICU babies, there's some uh, period of tube feeding. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do it. The babies you see here both have uh, nasal gastric tubes and are eating normally. Uh, on top of their food, their tube feeding, and that's the way of life for starting feeding for many NICU babies is uh, to um, start with small amounts of food by mouth and then uh, finish up a feeding by tube. If a baby's less than t 32 weeks, it's pretty likely that they're going to be all predominantly tube fed. Um, very few babies less than that can do more than take a, a sip now and then. It's really important that babies learn to uh, latch at the breast even before they're strong enough to really extract milk. 
There are all kinds of choices about feeding strategies, and the same strategy for one baby may, may not work for the next, but um, some of the things we we always use, feed into the stomach when we can, but um, if a baby is at great risk to aspirate um, milk that we put in the stomach, then we may put the feeding tube beyond the stomach. There's bolus feeding, maybe a term you hear, which is a feeding over a few minutes, or a continuous feeding is one that goes consistently over usually 24 hours, but some we gradually um, call it compressing it down to to less and less time so a baby can complete a feeding over half an hour. Um, if, the, if the feeding tube is beyond the stomach, it must be continuous because there's no reservoir to collect milk. So it, it's what the intestine expects. So um, if the baby needs to be fed uh, beyond the stomach, then it, the feedings for sure are going to be continuous. Um, we have choices of when to try to allow the baby to latch or bottle feed, and hopefully this is uh, in response to baby's cues. Standardized feeding protocols have been shown to improve outcomes in NICUs, and these protocols will usually address, you know, when to start an IV and with nutrition in it, exactly what's going to be in that IV, uh, recruiting colostrum, how to use it, how to give it, um, how to when to start milk feeds, how to advance them, um, goals for feeding and growth, what supplements are needed, such as iron and vitamin D, and discharge strategies. So they can get pretty elaborate. Um, I think maybe we win the prize for elaborate um, because we have very specific strategies that are different by gestational age uh, category of baby um, at our institution. Uh, feeding readiness is really variable. It's the um, baby trying to show us that they're ready to coordinate, suck, swallow, breathe. Um, and assessing it is um, a sophisticated nursing skill. And it's something parents often uh, learn and observe in their babies uh, and can be very helpful um, to NICU staff in letting us know what they think um, their baby's cues are about feeding readiness. Even small amounts of feeds can comfort babies. So even a few drops of colostrum or a few drops of milk uh, in the mouth can be a very important thing. Um, and it's important to have some sort of positive oral experience or oral stimulation, even when a baby is too small to eat for substantial nutrition. So NICUs use pacifiers, um, dunked in milk, or um, can, babies can suck on the tip of a, a finger, or um, there are a variety of, of things that can be done, but it's important that they be a positive experience, not a forced negative experience. And there are some babies that can't eat. Uh, even by the time they leave the NICU, and those babies are often uh, recommended to have gastrostomy tubes. I have a picture of one here because the thought really scares a lot of parents. But it's a small appliance. It um, is um, not painful, and it um, is something that uh, babies cope with really very well. They certainly can support normal growth. They can allow ease of learning oral feeding without having to have a tube in the nose or uh, esophagus to get in the way. And they're necessary if continuous feeds are needed at home. And we usually recommend them when a baby is anticipated and need uh, tube feeding for greater than a month after discharge. Feeding skill development is um, fraught with hazard in the NICU. It, it's a, um, something that some babies do with amazing ease and others really struggle with. It's normal in utero for a baby to drink about eight ounces a day of amniotic fluid. So the whole third trimester, the baby's sipping along, practicing, sucking, and swallowing. 
And this all comes to a screeching halt when the baby is born early and comes to the NICU. It, um, it t is weeks before a baby is usually taking eight ounces by mouth um, for a NICU baby. So if a baby is having any difficulty breathing, you know that it's hard to uh, eat while you're breathing rapidly, and that can slow down a lot of babies. Um, breastfeeding takes more strength than bottle feeding, so some baby, NICU babies um, need a combination of bottle and breastfeeding. And in general, feeding skill development takes work and patience, um, and many babies go home with a combination of breast and bottle feeding. So what can parents do while the baby's in the hospital? Provide breast milk is number one uh, thing um, that a nutritionist is going to think about for a baby to, to do. Um, mothers can help us with supply needs, keeping up with their own baby's supply. Moms should be cognizant of how much milk a baby gets in a 24-hour period and try to supply us with enough that we can have a day's supply plus at least another ounce because there's um, always the possibility the feeding rate's going to go up. We're going to lead to a little bit more. If the baby's being tube fed, you have to prime the tubing. So there's always a need for a, a little, at least a little bit more than what the baby actually is, takes. Um, mom should access lactation consultants that are available to, to them in NICUs because they're invaluable resources to help them with their milk supply and to um, help them um, get their baby to breast. We promote skin-to-skin -skin care, which allows the baby to smell the mother, to smell the breast milk, to kind of get ready to be uh, to eat. It also does a whole lot of other things for mothers that probably your NICU nurses have told you about. It's also the mo one of the most powerful things you can do to keep up your milk supply to be adequate is um, putting the baby skin to skin. Parents learn to read baby's signals of hunger and readiness to feed, and that's very important. It's important to communicate those to um, the uh, nurses that are taking care of your baby or the doctors as well, and say, my baby really acts hungry. Is it possible that we could begin to feed them by mouth, or my baby's hungry on a different schedule than you're feeding them? Is it possible for me to feed them a little bit when um, they actually seem awake and alert and ready to feed? It's important for parents to participate in feeding the baby. It's reasonable that you ask to see the growth charts. I can tell you all NICUs are going to be um, plotting growth of babies. Um, and you should ask any questions you have about nutrition or feeding as they come up. While we say breastfeeding is best, it's difficult to establish full suckling in the smallest babies if there's not been a, a lot of hospital experience. And a lot for me is not two or three times a week. I'm thinking two or three times a day. Babies really need a lot of practice if they're going to be able to make the transition to suckling at home. And there needs to be, um, I understand that after discharge, um, having to pump and then try to bottle feed breast milk is overwhelming for some families because it's um, there's just hardly enough hours in the day. So that's why we, we try to support moms in helping their babies actually get to breast. Um, even at home, supplementation of mom's milk may be needed for the babies that were born the earliest. And what we're looking for is not calories so much as protein, um, calcium, iron, zinc, vitamin D, and maybe other nutrients. There are special formulas designed for ex preterm infants for the first year of life. Um, and we often um, suggest that even breastfeeding babies have a couple feeds a day of these to supplement the, the nutrients I just mentioned. Um, and if a, 
a mom doesn't have enough breast milk or uh, is going to exclusively formula feed an ex-premie at home, then these special formulas are usually recommended. When the baby gets home, it's important that you continue to let the baby run the show about the feeding schedule. Try to know and acknowledge your baby's signs of, of hunger and feeding readiness and feed whenever the baby wants to. Um, in NICUs, if we could do this, we would, but we often can't quite do it. Um, we, you should expect that daily feeding volumes will vary some when the baby's in the NICU. You know, we feed the same volume most feeds. Um, we're pretty regimented about it. And we are uh, possessed with measuring intakes and outputs. And it, it's really hard to let go of when you, your baby goes home because you, you're um, so used to watching them so closely. But I suggest that that is not the way the system was designed. The baby is supposed to go to breast. It's supposed to take what it feels like it needs. It knows when it's having a growth spurt and it's going to need more. It knows when it's refluxing and it's time to stop. It knows um, it, when it needs to uh, refill the tank again. And so if a goal is to work uh, with the baby to recognize their signs and signals of hunger and, and wanting to feed. It's helpful to know that in 24 hours you may want to feed a baby um, six to eight times or a normal breastfed baby, even a term infant, will feed 10 to 12 times a day sometimes. So um, the real test of is your baby getting enough to eat is does your baby grow? And to know that, you're probably going to have to go to the pediatrician's office. It's helpful to know that normal growth is about an ounce a day for the first three months of life or um, seven ounces a week. And that then between three and six months, there's a typo on the slide, um, the baby's rate of growth slows down to only about five ounces a week. And then... Gradually, it, it slows down even more after six months and, and over the first couple of years of life. So that ounce a day that you may have been looking for in the NICU and, and early on in your baby's um, time at home is really not appropriate after the baby's three months corrected age, and you want to be careful not to push for that. Um, or you can wind up with a baby that's significantly overweight. Again, you should ask your pediatrician or whoever is helping take care of your baby um, any questions you have about nutrition of feeding. And you should um, consider the introduction of solids by their corrected age, which right now the American Academy of Pediatrics suggests introduction of solids around six months of age. Um, it's that's not unusual in my world. It's unusual in the whole world, but it's not. Uh, there's certainly many, many babies that require tube feeding at home. Um, if long-term tube feeding is required, we usually recommend a gastrostomy tube because it's a much safer way to do it, and it's. I think it, it makes an easier transition to oral feeding when the baby is ready for that. There are many specialized clinics available to help with the transition off of tube feeding. And these may be in a gastroenterology office. Sometimes they're uh, in the surgeon's office, may help with uh, the home tube feeding management. The pulmonologist, the lung doctors, like the place where I work, uh, may have a dietitian that helps uh, with the children that have both breathing and feeding difficulties. Um, would are the, because those children are at risk for aspiration and the pulmonologist often needs to help decide when the baby's breathing is um, adequate, that they, it's reasonable that they can try to feed on top. Um, pediatricians may always help with feeding advances. 
there may be a dietitian that's part of any of the clinics we've talked about. Um, not always, but usually the GI office and the pulmonary office is going to have a dietitian there. And um, they certainly can be uh, a source to help with feeding plans and questions parents have. Um, but still, the parents are the very best person to know when is it the right time to feed the baby, when are they ready to transition off of, of tube feeding, and it's very helpful for parents to bring information about what, what the baby's telling them so that the physicians can uh, incorporate the baby's needs and wishes into their care plans. So what if oral aversion happens? You may have heard of oral aversion, which means that, that children just refuse to eat. Um, and this, this is more common in NICU babies that have not been able to transition to oral feeding at the usual time um, before term. Um, particularly babies that have been um, children that have, have needed uh, a number of negative oral experiences such as intubation for breathing equipment or feeding tube placements that were traumatic or uh, surgeries in their, to their mouth and face. These children often are not anxious to eat. And sometimes it... Um, a special clinic is is needed to help out with that. At these clinics, you usually find someone from speech or occupational therapy. There's usually a physician that's used to dealing with children with complex problems. There's usually a dietitian there, as well as others that help uh, families learn uh, teach their children to eat normally. These programs are fairly scarce. There's usually one or two per state. And any of the specialized clinics that deal with home tube feeding that I mentioned previously are likely to know the resources in your uh, your area. Treatment is not fast. It takes weeks or months, and that's um, just the way it is. It's, it's much harder to develop feeding skill at a time different than around term age. So, Ask your home tube feeding resource if your child is a candidate to be helped by a specialized program. So I hope this has helped you get into what is your normal for your child. I hope you can make feeding a pleasurable experience. And even a child that is not eating, any positive oral experience is important, whether it be the smell of food, whether it be a little taste on their lips, almost like chapstick. Um, all of those things are important in um, the long run. Um, there are many different good options about feeding infants. Um, you should expect that feeding behaviors will vary from day to day, and hopefully all of this will help you enjoy your baby. And I think we'll stop here, and I'll take any questions you may have. Great. Again, participants, if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat screen on the side of your screen. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions uh, right now, so I think we will go ahead and end the session. Um, however, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can reach me at info at pebblesofhope.org. Um, please, again, also visit our website, and, and my contact information is there. And if you have any um, other questions, you know, I can um, perhaps field them to Sandy and, and you know, try to get you a response. So thank, thank you. you again, everyone, for participating, and I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you.